few years ago in July 2017, I walked the Camino de Santiago with my dad and my son James, who was 13 at the time. We started just north of Porto and finished in the Spanish city of Santiago de Compostela. We enjoyed the simple things in life, a coffee, a glass of wine, a meal. We walked through the olive groves alongside the Atlantic Ocean, through cities where pilgrims had walked for centuries. We chatted to fellow travelers, sometimes many in one day, other times not meeting another human being for hours on end. For the first time ever in my life, I wasn't thinking or overthinking. I was simply putting one foot in front of the other and I felt so alive. My reflections at that time were incredibly basic. This walk with its predetermined destination struck me as a metaphor for life and death. From the moment we take our first breath, one thing is certain. Each one of us will meet with death. We just don't know the route we will take to get there the treasures we might find along the way, the people we might meet, the obstacles we might be confronted with, the hurts we might suffer. A few months after the joy and enlightenment of the Camino, on the 1st of December 2017, my husband John was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Yes, that cancer the cancer that makes people look at you and shake their head. The one they call the silent killer. The cancer that your kids Google and then tell you that it's the deadliest common cancer in Northern Ireland. And the only 6% of people survive beyond five years. John was then 44 years old, a fit, healthy father of three, who married me, his childhood sweetheart, and who loved me, his family, scuba diving, gadgets, and Liverpool Football Club, probably in that order. He had such a good chance of being in the 6%. His cancer was detected early following a yellowing of the skin. The kids even called him Homer Simpson for a while. Humor is essential in cancer conversations, at least in our family, and the darker the better. John had successful surgery known as the Whipple's procedure. He also had eight months of chemotherapy. He continued to work full time. His checkups went well. Our approach as a family was go ahead and live life. Put cancer behind you. Then in April 2019, a routine checkup and scan revealed something sinister. Sinister is a word used by medical professionals that I came to loathe. It means bad news. The cancer was in the lymph nodes and lungs. John died 18 months later, on the 26th of October, 2020. He was aged 47. He left me and his three children, Rosie, then aged 18, James, who had just turned 17, and Holly, who was 15. Three teenagers. When you're presented with a terminal diagnosis, unlike the Camino, you don't know the route you're taking. You don't know how long you have. You've no idea if you're fit enough for the journey ahead. You're not sure if you have the right kit and you're unaware of the support you will need to sustain your strength. You do know one thing with certainty, the destination. The person you love, the father of your children, is going to die, and there's nothing you can do to change the outcome. The only thing I could do was to make sure that I took responsibility for myself as a wife and a mother. 
that in the time we had left together, I could help us live well, so that John could die well. Live well to die well became my driving force. I made it my business to learn as much as I could about how to deal with a terminal diagnosis. I spoke to the highly skilled people at the Cancer Fund for Children. I met regularly with a counsellor. I spoke to family and friends who had experienced the death of a loved one because of cancer. I read books and listened to podcasts like You, Me and the Big C. I watched Afterlife and The Fault in Our Stars. All of these helped me feel like I was doing something useful, equipping myself for the journey ahead. I wondered a lot about how I could be of use to those who support young people. So I did what I always do. I talked to those who know, my three children. Just don't be boring, Mum. Give them something to remember. So we came up with the theme of shoes and the different sorts of footwear you need for different occasions on life's journey. First of all, sturdy boots. You must have a decent pair of all-terrain boots. Having three children is like having many different terrains to deal with. Each one is unique. Each one throws up their own challenges, and they still do. Only a couple of days ago, one of them said to me, I wish it was you and not dad. Of course, they didn't mean it. When we received the news of John's terminal diagnosis in April 2019, my daughter Rosie was in the middle of her AS level exams. A support worker once told me that when you withhold information, young people will fill in the gaps. They'll create their own narratives and lose trust in you. So first time around, we had made a promise to the children to always share the information with them first and unfiltered. They could ask any question they wanted to and we would always be as open and honest as possible. Up to now, we had managed to stay true to this. But for the first time in our experience of cancer, John and I decided not to tell the children the news straight away. The waiting for Rosie's exams to be over was incredibly tough for me and John. We took time to prepare ourselves for the conversation. Each day we watched them ever more closely, blissful in their ignorance unaware of the danger ahead. By the time we talked to them in May, I was ready. Ready in the sense that it was the right thing to do. And so it had to be done. John and I agreed that I would do the talking. I gave the children the cold hard facts, no sugarcoating. Dad's cancer is back. This time there is no cure. He's going to die. It was the hardest conversation I have ever had. Each reacted differently, then and in the days after, the days that unfolded. James called it Dad's hilarious prank. Holly was upset. Rosie was angry. I let the schools and the important people in the kids' lives know. But telling is only the start of it. As you move forward, the terrain can get very muddy at this stage of your journey. You can feel stuck, dirty, heavy, like every step you take requires all your strength. Holly came home from school the next day, upset because she had had a French exam. She had tried to tell the teacher that she had received news about her dad. Unfortunately, the teacher was busy and didn't have time to speak to her in private, so Holly was forced to tell her in front of the class. For Holly, the emotions often overwhelmed her. 
And that's the thing. You have all the normal stuff of teenage life. Friendship groups, study, school, hormones, emotions. And then you have cancer thrown into the mix. My counsellor once said to me, everyone needs a villain and you're it. That simple phrase helped reframe the intensity of the emotion that sometimes emerged during this time. James was swimming competitively then, so I was still getting up at 5.07 each morning to take him to the pool. For him, routine was important, so it was very much business as usual. I was often so tired in the evenings from the demands of caring for John and the children. Rosie was exploring university choices, so she focused on working towards that. London was calling her name and nothing was going to stop her. We still went to visit unis in London and she was excited to share her observations with her dad, even though he wasn't well enough to join us on that particular trip. Rosie reminded me of the importance of having people in her life who encouraged her in her studies. People who helped her see a way through to working on her own goals and aspirations. For her to find a way for cancer not to define her, even if it inevitably shapes you. Looking back over our family group messages from around that time, what I notice is how we just tried to keep everything moving. My texts are a mixture of fact-filled updates from the Bridgewater Cancer Centre, logistics and calls for the kids to do their chores. You still have all the demands of day-to-day -day life with teenagers and cancer on top. Our weeks were dictated by medical appointments and chemo schedules, making the planning of anything else practically impossible. John's platelets were low and he was frequently bumped for chemo, which caused immense frustration and tension in the family at times. It's so easy to get hooked on the idea that chemo equals more life. In some cases, particularly John's, it actually meant less ability to enjoy life. And we were all very glad when it eventually stopped. We could live again more fully, even if it was just for a short time. When you pull off your muddy boots, it's a lovely feeling to put on some cozy slippers. The kids laughed at mine, which they call granny slippers, but they're just what you need for comfort and feeling at home. There were many times during the 18 months when we didn't talk about cancer at all or John's impending death. Each of us doing our own thing, as well as sharing family time together. I'm incredibly grateful for those times. Times when we went for a walk, shared a family meal, visited places that meant something special to John, like Castle Rock or the Loch Shore. On those occasions, Rosie's in Rosie in particular took many selfies and videos with her dad and they have been a great source of comfort to her since. James watched Star Wars and Marvel movies with him. I was often worried that he would regret not having spent more time with his dad. So I had a few conversations with him about just hanging out together, even though sometimes it looked like John wasn't interested. He was, always. But he did never want the children to feel pressured into spending time with him. Holly loved to share all her gaming exploits and digital designs with John. She has a wicked sense of humour. So the party game, pin the tail on the donkey, became pin the tumour on dad to guess what the latest scam would show up. As time went on, she found it harder and harder to spend time with him. I learned to let them find their own way and make their own choices. The third type of shoes you need are high heels. Sometimes in life, you have to step up, put your shoulders back and step forward. 
even though you may feel like you're teetering on the edge. But wearing high heels for a long time can be uncomfortable and you can't walk too far in them. The summer of 2020 was like that. During COVID, John and I had two months apart from the children when he was required to isolate. And then we had a very happy reunion. I could see that John was deteriorating and I was still caring for him on my own with the children making tea and coffee, fetching meds and running errands. It wasn't clear exactly whose care he was under, whether oncology or primary care. I spoke to our specialist nurse practitioner who told me that she would do a referral for John to the hospice nurse. Our hospice nurse came once a week. She got to know us as best she could, which made a really big difference to me, giving me confidence that I was meeting both his needs and the children's. John's meds started to increase and weekends became challenging as I tried to manage his pain. It was distressing at times for the children and they sometimes find it difficult to look at his suffering. Holly and Rosie both received support from the Cancer Fund for Children Workers and it helped them immensely. I know they didn't want to worry me, so having someone else to talk to about their dad's illness was comforting. James did not want to speak to anyone about his dad dying. Even when it happened, it was several days before he told his friends that his dad had died. Sometimes I would be doing something mundane, like taking James to swim, and I would get a call that John wasn't well. I would return home, assess the situation, and call out of ours or an ambulance. This was particularly traumatic for the children, especially if John was yelling out in pain. This not knowing caused tension and a heightened state of anxiety. In September 2020, after I had taken Rosie off to university in London, I returned home to find a John whose sparkle had diminished. He was very ill and I knew it. He developed a blood clot a couple of days later and was taken to Antrim Hospital in an ambulance. Because of COVID restrictions, no one could visit him for four days. That was when I thought I would fall over. I did not want John to die alone. He didn't want to die alone or not get the chance to say goodbye to the children. Thankfully, John rallied, and the day after he got home from hospital on the 29th of September 2020, we went to Daisy Lodge in Newcastle for a parent's wellbeing day. John was determined to make it. It was a very important time for us as we prepared for the end. John had confronted his fear alone in the hospital and we became really focused on him doing and saying anything he wanted to, to the kids, to his family, and to his friends. He wrote some final letters, which he gave for me to give to the children and his parents afterwards. Finally, there's the occasion where no footwear is necessary. When you're barefoot, your feet are not protected. You can get hurt easily, yet somehow you're connected to something beyond yourself. For me, this is how it felt in the last few weeks of John's life. After we came home from Daisy Lodge, John was in the dying phase. No one told us that. I asked because it was getting harder and harder to meet his needs. At that time, we still had the nurse come once a week. I was doing all of the caring. John didn't get out of bed much. It was hard for the kids to know how to be with him. 
I remember I talked to the nurse on Monday the 12th of October. I said that I thought John was dying. We had already agreed that he wanted to go to the hospice to die. He didn't want the children to have the memory of him dying at home. A place became available for John two days later. I talked to the children about how it was unlikely that dad would come back home. At this stage, John still hoped his stay in the hospice would be for respite and to get his energy back. COVID was a challenge because of visitor rules. John and I had to make some very tough decisions about who would be on the list. It was me as the primary carer, Rosie and James. Holly was under 16, so she wasn't allowed to go, although an exception was made by the senior consultant when it looked like he was going to die imminently at one point. So for the final seven days of John's life in the hospice, Rosie and I were there and we didn't leave. It was her choice to do that. James and Holly came to visit. The consultant helped explain to the children what was happening and gave them the chance to ask questions. This was an incredibly important step. Rosie is still very sensitive to noise. Noise is something that no one tells you about. Drips bleep, syringe drivers alarm, laboured breathing, a collapsing lung, spasms, they all make noises that stay with you. Even the last exhalation makes a sound. In talking to young people, remember the four different types of footwear. All terrain boots. Children are different and each one needs different things from you. They each have their own wishes and they need to be respected for making their own choices. Slippers. Remember to create opportunities for the simple things in life that aren't all about cancer. High heels. Step up and step forward, even though it's uncomfortable. Help people to have the tough conversations. Barefoot. Help people prepare for the reality of the end, the sensory experience of death. Thank you for listening. Listening is one of the most powerful gifts you can give another human being.